fringe on your Fridays. I had a family situation I had to deal with yesterday. But I must say I'm very pleased with all the papers I got back for the homework. So I guess our sacrifice of these um, times has not been in vain. <laughs> Let me put it like that. It was very few um, points that um, could have been added. So I, um, I have them highlighted and I'll um, put the score on them and then just return them to you via the email. I already got um, the ones for the second assignment. So I'll um, try this weekend to do the same thing and make sure that I have them ready for you uh, before next class. Our time is slowly winding down. But um, like I say, I think it's been a, it's been a productive time. It's really been a productive time. I don't know how you feel about yourself. I guess I will come with an assessment at the end of the course. But usually with the exam, I think they try to, our last class would be next week. Now, I think they try to give, I guess, a maximum of two weeks. Do you guys feel two weeks would be in order or do you want to have the test within the following week after? Two weeks is good for me. Two weeks is good for me. Okay, so who that's um Blair or, yes. or Blair? Two weeks after the last class is what you say. Um, that's the maximum time they usually um do for the exam. So I'm just trying to get a feedback so I could confirm and get the set date for our exam. So is everyone here in agreement with two weeks or anybody prefer the following week? I just need to get consensus. Well, how is the will the exam be set up? Is it is it also online? Um, no, you have to actually go in. I think uh, maybe I'm not. Miguel may have to speak to that because I know you guys are in Freeport. So, yeah, um, I'll have to check with him with regard to that. Miguel is Miguel. Miguel, I don't think he's. Um, in in tune with us right now, so I will have to confirm the. But I know it's usually held on a Saturday. So although I think I may have had the twenty fourth or something on the paper based on the initial thing, I think factoring in two weeks would take it beyond that. So everyone here is in agreement for the two weeks time frame. Um, I think two weeks would be, um, but that would make it Saturday, June 5th. That's actually a holiday weekend. Right. So that's why it may be an adjustment. So actually, um, I'll, I'll just put it out to Miguel to get back to us with the established date they would have, they, um, would have agreed to. Okay. Yeah. But, um, as close to the two weeks as possible then, that's what you're saying. I, see, because it has to be on a Saturday, then that would push it out even if that, sat, that Saturday is a holiday weekend, yeah. Because you have, that's, um, is that the Labor Day weekend? Yes, it is. Okay, okay. All right, so I'll get back to you guys with regard to to that but you are you would have gotten the final up to chapter eight from him as well yes okay okay i didn't get any emails you didn't no i don't think your institution loves me uh, <laughs> I don't ask either. Leah, you didn't get any no ma'am not a oh. stick oh gosh anyway I know I, I don't send it because it's um because of the size and stuff I um a lot of times it, they um I have it bounces back or doesn't go through even I try to split them up into parts like even chapter six I would try to do it in two parts right yeah 
But Blair, definitely, I'll I'll make sure you um you pick get your uh, copies. Okay, thank you. I think it's a like I said, I picked that book particularly because it's um it's kind of compact in terms of the uh, the components, the core components that are really important right now. And what you would find is although we're shifting into electronic, okay, they would they most of the um, information coming out now won't really focus on a lot of how to do physical inventories and estimating paper volumes as much anymore because of the fact that um, the whole push now is managing electronic electronic records. So that, um, but any, any particular questions so far with regard to the topics that we would have covered? Anyone? have any any concerns about information about vital records or have um, queries with regard to vital records or even the inventory information we would have shared because we know that these are components of the program the records management program it has to have that um, structured framework that part of it relates to governance that's your policies, your procedures, your process, controls, those type of things. You need that built in at the top. I know and above all of that, you need to have your senior support. You know, so that, that framework is is key to being able to add in all your other um, components that you would need for the program. So as it relates to governance, because sometimes you hear people talk about records management and governance intertwined. Actually governance um, overarches records management because controls, procedures, you need that um, throughout the enterprise, okay? But as a sub um, component, the records management aspect is there because that key focus is your corporate information, how it comes in, how it flows out, what needs protection, and that type of thing. So in terms of understanding that aspect, the governance component versus records management, any comments, any thoughts with regard to that? Um, Ms. Tucker, I, I did the, um, I did a Zoom. Um, oh, you do, you went the, on records the, model. Um, the armor one, they oh, had okay. a day mm. about, um, it says, it, the title was your employee suck at record, records management. Ah, uh -huh. how and did they, you enjoy it? It was very good. I, I was particularly, I, I normally like the case studies anyway. Um, mm -hmm. He was talking about um, some litigation procedures. I forgot his name. Because, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes a lot of them, they, they also, um, they would record them, you know, if persons miss. So sometimes you have, especially like with the, uh, if anyone went on the site for the Records Management Institute, RMU, my records management university if you no. look if you go on their page um all of their sessions that they would have done not only this year last year i think maybe up to three years they're there and so if it's a topic that um you need more clarity on that's a good place to go because they are youtube videos that they would have recorded yeah um mm -hmm. He, he, was, he was basically talking about a, um, a couple of cases that they had where they they um they settled out of court for twenty eight million dollars for this one. It was a couple of companies that had sued them, and because they had a good records management program in in place, where they had destroyed and kept what needed to be kept and all of that stuff. 
they were able to settle for the $28 million. So they won the case. Um, but it was just a couple of interesting cases like that where uh, companies were, what um, companies got in trouble because either the companies got in trouble because they had too many records or they got in trouble or they won because they did it well. So I thought that was interesting. And I didn't even know you could win that much money from just paper. <laughs> just <laughs> paper. Yes. You think paper is not important or um, records are not important, but they really are. But you see, it's, it's, also, um, that's, that goes back to the point of it being an asset information right. right and so it does have value although on the face of it persons you know um tend mm -hmm. to miss it but just the same way um you you handle your important assets like i would have alluded to in the past your cash okay your property your um deeds etc um that 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 um type of value is also equated to different types of information you know, so that's why we just can't have it hanging out there. That's why we have to make sure from the break, we have that classification in place so that we can then um, apply the necessary protections based on the value, you know? Right. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, they are good resources. And, and if the, Despite having the book, like I say, it's always good to have links to different online things that you can um, you can tap into. And like I say, a lot of the communities, they're interactive. So if you create an account, you get to go to, to join the community. And what they do is they, if you have a problem, if you have a situation that you're trying to um, come up with a solution for, you, there's a there place where you can post questions to the group. You know, and they, yeah. yeah, so they're very good like that. Okay. Yeah. So in going over the um the work, the homework, like I said, everyone pretty much was on target with the records management, um, the records management aspect. So I was looking for a definition um, in terms of what it is, and then um, basically something to highlight what is a record as well and um, something in relation to um, principles and um, the standards stuff like that in terms of the um, the com program components pretty much everyone basically was able to give those five components and just some um, pointers around it and um, the fact that the, um, you know, the program itself needs your, needs that support. So, like I said, everybody did well. And I, what I would do in terms of uh, the paper, I'll just highlight the points that were, were what I was looking for. I'll just highlight them when I return the document. And it allowed just um, some comments in terms of the grade out of 10, some comments with regard to something that any, like I said, some papers had more on the, um, that would have been the principles, generally accepted record keeping principles. Now you didn't really have to go the maturity model Pretty much that's for like auditing if you want to audit your program so um you didn't have to mention that part but there should have been something about those record keeping principles and also like the five components that are part of of the program so i also yeah there was also some mention about standards, yeah. Yeah, some persons did provide a, a snapshot on, on that as well. So I was, I was very pleased with the papers, I must say. So thank you. Now I know we, we have to look at vital records. We didn't really, I don't know if we really, um, you just got those papers from Miguel, eh? 
The one yes. is chapter yes. eight. Okay. The one um so that it was the last part pretty much was talking about the electronic records. I think. Um so basically we have the vital records and the main thing out of that particular chapter was for you to really understand, you know, because what I find is that persons would tend to, when you go into the, a department and you're, you're talking about things that um, are considered vital because persons know, well, oh, I'm doing this, um, function and I, I look at this and that, so you tend to end up sometime with people saying everything is vital, but that's not the point. Vital is related to information that if like how Hurricane Dorian happened or we're, how we're in the midst of a pandemic and people have been forced to work from home. What are those things that are absolutely essential to doing that that function that job and that is what is vital and that is what you have to focus on when you look at the job backup strategy and who has to have access and who performs what function so when we're talking about vital we're talking about um, things that are indispensable to your operation today or tomorrow um, you were to lose that particular record or information, um, it could kill you. It, it, it could really shatter you. And so it's not records that are second or dairy that you couldn't get from somewhere else. It's those critical things that are linked to you. And it's very, um, it's irreplaceable, so to speak. So anyone cannot right off the bat say something in their environment that they consider vital for your operation can you repeat the question please i was asking in in the chapter that focused on vital records it talks about them in the as as records that should something happen, would loss of those records put you out of business or seriously incapacitate you from being able to resume your functions? And, and these, yeah, these type of records, basically they're linked to your business continuity plan. So does anyone have a business continuity plan? I don't know what that is. Okay. Maybe I know it as a name. I don't know. Huh? What, I don't know what it. Maybe I don't have the same name for it. What is it entail? What is um, it? It's, some people call it disaster recovery. Oh yes, we have one of those. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So yeah. so basically, that is a plan um, that is developed by the organization. They basically would have to. Um, engage all the various departments okay and it involves hr because people are your most valuable resources in terms of helping you carry and execute your business function so there are, there are various things within that plan that focus on protecting the people making contact how long can you be without um you know, how long is it be, without your service before you're able to resume again so it has some technical terms in there when you're thinking about um disaster recovery or business continuity in terms of your re recovery time you what, what type of recovery time you have how long can you actually go without doing that function before it causes a problem so Basically, why the vital records are in there is because they are, they are absolutely necessary to do business. So 
the vital records, they, you have to make sure that um, some program is in place to protect them. So I was asking um, based on that. Excuse me, Ms. Tucker? Yes. I have, the, I, have the step, I have the step away for one minute, okay? No problem. But no before problem. I go, I get, I get maybe share our vital records because we deal with um, documents and Brooke can help me with this. I think, Brooke, you could help me. I think our Lord control cards would be a vital record. Yeah, yeah, I didn't hear. Uh, uh, we have lot control cards. It's basically because um, we deal with uh, property. Property. Oh, okay. Um, so the, the lot control inventory um, is basically just a brief history mm -hmm. of each lot. Oh. That deal with. Yeah, so, so definitely. Yeah. Because um, that's, that's what you deal with. And, and then that, that, something that happens. Has, um, with preventing for instance, double decking. Okay. Um, if, if the sales team is looking to sell a property, then we would have to check a lot control to make sure that that property hasn't already been sold or that okay. it's tied up on some legal issue. Okay. Uh, so th that's what our, our lot control does. Okay. That, so that def definitely is a vital record for us. Right. So, so um, how that would now tie in is because with your disaster, your business continuity plan, what would have to happen is that this, your, that plan should stipulate in the event of a disaster, this, these particular records are vital. They're located at this particular spot. Um, what are the protections around it? Is it that you have duplicated these and have them stored somewhere else? So like all of that is why with vital records, you, you, would, you would have to be communicating with the the business continuity team, and then you would also um, basically have to make sure that you have protections for those records, you know, you know where they are, that type of thing. Yeah, so that's a very good example. That's a very good example, based on the nature of your business, and you're dealing with lots, and you have to, um, you would have documented what was happening, and so in order to, if anything happens, you need those, those records because that's, that's information with regard to your business, right? And which what would have transacted. Right. Okay. Okay, so anyone have any other? And then the, the thing with the term is you have to also remember there are some other types of records we call vital records. Anyone um, could kind of, Shed some light on them. Obvious records. Some other records that we call vital pertaining to us. The term is used for them as well. You mean like our passwords and stuff? You mean personal stuff? Um, yeah, some vital, some vital records would be your birth certificate. Right. Your marriage certificate. Okay, if you got a um, if you got a divorce or something like that, so they they are they are vital records, and those particular records are dealt with or managed by government. You know, so so when you hear stories around, like the lady who went to do one transaction, that was to register her baby and found out what they she was married. So that was a that was that's a big conundrum. That that um, says something about um, fraudulent activities, you know. And I, did any of you hear about that? Yes, I heard about it. There was also another story where um, another lady went to register to marry this uh, her first marriage and mm. found out that she was already married. You know, and so that's because I guess too, it's it's vital and you don't expect that type of thing to be carrying on. So I don't think people really, you know, say, well, at, at some point in time, say, well, just let me request a copy just to see, you know, if everything is, is in, in place or normal or what have you, you know? And so that, that whole issue about um, the integrity is so, so important you know, because who has access? And so also 
these type of things, um, they, they, they should have some type of, of penalties attached and stuff like that. So definitely, if you do something like that, you expect it to go before the court and be, and be charged, you know. But let's look at it in companies. People, um, in one scenario, somebody where someone worked, they were saying like, if a person got fired, you would, you would maybe see them asking for certain files or documents. And so when they're gone, that information is gone as well. So, you know, in terms of controls, that, that, um, that raises a flag, you know, some companies, when you leave, if you have records checked out to you, and that's if you have that control in place, because if you're just letting, if you're responsible for records and information, there should be some tracking process in place to say, well, this was requested by so-and-so, because remember now, these are company records, not individuals. Although you find in some scenarios, that's how people treat them. I, these, my, this, my files or whatever, and nobody could deal with it. But if you're working for the same entity, you have um, particular things to accomplish. And part of that involves the records or the information being generated, you know, unless they are controls related to security, then that shouldn't be the case. And so you should be able to access the information you need to do your job. And Ms. Docker, mm -hmm. um, to your point, one of the things the guy was saying on the, the call was um, when they had researched, there was a guy in the company who had, he was responsible for the disposition of the records. Mm -hmm. He had been making his own copies and taking them home. Mm. So <laughs> that ain't so disposition. That it followed, followed the the file plan and the retention schedule and all of that. All of that was was a plus, but it was just him um, having a backup. I don't know why he was keeping them, but he was making a copy before he shredded the document. Oh wow! Home to his house. <laughs> That's a no no. So the company was still like. Yeah, yeah, that's the whole that's the whole scary part too when you have hybrid systems. Okay? Because with a hybrid system what is happening is you're destroying one and not destroying the other. So in some cases where they have a good electronic setup, if they have an electronic setup, then what happens is that you would then have one part routinely doing the destruction and then the other part not being destroyed. So the, the physical paper still in the storage somewhere, but in the system, you have routinely cleaned up. And so lawyers and attorneys, they, they, they know all these little loopholes and stuff. So if they know you have a hybrid system, they're going to be sure to check that nothing there in paper. So they will be requesting left, right, and center. And if you haven't been thorough, then like you say, you're liable. So even if it's a copy that an employee just keeps there for whatever reason. So that's why disposition should be something your employees understand. When it's gone, it's gone. The only thing that should be in place is that um, destruction certificate or whatever type of electronic um, record you would create to say this particular series of records were dispositioned this date and by whoever authorized, you know, but it's to that small degree, no longer an actual image of what was destroyed. Well, what kind of demons internal audit and auditors have, but they seem to be able to request the uh -huh. wrong thing. <laughs> so that, that file you were trying to hide, they be able to sniff it out, I don't know, in their, in their random searches. Because they say the list is random, but I ain't really convinced that the list is random at all. Uh -huh. But you know, be able to sniff out uh -huh. bad files. <laughs> 
Oh boy, but you know, with them, with the experience, I guess, with them coming and dealing with controls and stuff like that, they they get that. Um, although they they're not really dedicated records managers, they they mm -hmm. the controls, and so they can be your friend as well. Because um, if you come in and your your communication is good, they can show you. Um, yeah what you need to improve and make sure it's in place. Right. Yeah. yeah. I found that to be true too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So that, um, that is a good, good, excellent um, case study thing that you brought up because in actuality, as we um, become more, or as we say, we digitally transform more, you know, then um, you know a lot of a lot of things tend to show because when you're digitally transforming, it's not just the the fact that you're not you don't have it in a paper format. It's now in an electronic format. It it invokes another um, another level because then that that should transcribe into your processes and and the way the work flows because when things are frustrating in terms of where to go and what else to do persons find they still find a way to work around that electronic system you know and so when you think oh everything's there electronically and smooth sailing you still find like the guy making the copies that people still have their paper stash you know, and um, that can that can really um, be a, a liability. Okay, so I have, let me see if I can share. I had some stuff up with regard to the electronic records, but we also wanted to talk about um, not bre not so much in depth. Like I say, this is this is a a fundamental. So you just want to have an idea of of each of these various components. And basically, with electronic records, like we say, it's it's not it's um, multimedia thing and and electronic records now. Uh, very, the whole category is, it's so expansive. You have your structured and you have your unstructured records. You have things now with, um, like I say, the move to everything online. So social media, that, um, that generates records, you know, especially, and that's why the whole concept of when they talk about bring your own device, there has to be controls around that as well, you know, because it's corporate records and personal. So, so even that there's, there has to be that delineation between personal and corporate. So if you're bringing your own device and you're dealing with company businesses, business matters, transactions, et cetera, there must be some type of control. So you're, you're getting into things like a, um, a VPN access type of thing. And then you, you should know that if it's a company device, even if it's a phone, records come from phone conversations as well. So if it's a company phone, you only want to use that for what? To call your bestie? to take um, messages on that? No? Yes? It's a corporate device. And if anything comes up, like a litigation matter, you know that they, they take phones, they take laptops as well. So the whole records management sphere encompasses all these new things now, because if it's a corporate device, then you should you should treat it as work um, within the work sphere, within the work environment. 
So, so you have to take the to strict precautions to ensure you only utilize it for business purposes. Because at the end of the day, although if it's mixed up with your personal and your business affairs and anything comes up, it's gonna be taken from you because it contains corporate information. And like I said, we know corporate information is not your personal information. So, I'm back, Ms. Tucker. Oh, no problem, no problem. So we're, we're just getting, I'm just getting ready now to basically tonight, I really wanted to share just some more insight with regard to electronic records. Okay, so I'm going to do, a, I think I gave a, um, I think the, a, a sheet one, where I just had some highlights about responsibilities. Um, I think uh, definition of um, the record and records management. So I'll prepare a sheet two, which will cover, like I say, the high points, the things that you really need to focus on and make sure you're comfortable with. So although I'm with this, I'm kind of going over this tonight, I'll I'll follow it up with the with the notes. Is that okay? So yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, so will you be reading from chapter is it seven that you said? Um I, don't, I, I, don't I I'm gonna you don't have chapter seven? I did no, I did email it to you sent, like last time. Oh you sent it to me? No, I'll do it right now. Oh, okay. You. No problem. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. so the Okay, the vital records, I think that was chapter six, right? I don't have the, I don't have the book right in front of me. Yeah, so it's chapter six. Okay, and then we had seven and eight. I, I'm trying to remember if eight was the last one, the discussion on um, the systems, picking a system. It says digital documents. Right, right, right. Well, digital documents. Um, they're gonna they're gonna give you more information on, on um I guess the different types and, and stuff like that as well. But I just wanted to mention some some additional notes that I said I'll I'll follow up in terms of the handout, like a second handout with the, the key components like the test itself, it'll be multiple choice. And then you would probably have like two, two essays, which could be on a concept that we've talked about, components of the program or like the life cycle. So that's why um, we're, we're doing these um, little exercises to pretty much know um, what, what uh, should be mentioned in, in doing a brief um, essay on, on one of the, the component topics. Okay, so basically um, electronic records like the paper records could, could include policies and directives. They could be correspondence and memos, work schedules, assignments, drafts of, of um, circulated documents for approval. They could also be emails. Now, email wasn't really designed to be a record. Email was like your mailbox. Like when you, you use that facility to um, transfer the information, the, your mailbox, you put the letters in or you, you address them a certain way and so that they could go to that particular individual, that particular envelope receives it, they have to open the envelope, take out and do whatever based on the information that was presented. But what has happened now is that persons have incorporated, as opposed to saying in an email um, the subject, what it's about, and saying attached is a document with respect to something, because the attachment is basically 
that's the record and that's what you should then file accordingly electronically you know but base basically persons use that inbox for receipt of all the things and what they do they just have them sitting there without um a plan to say well is this but you know you got to still manage your emails the email itself is not a record series the email is it's um facilitating communication electronically so basically when you get an email you have to do something with it and don't use it as a storage box but in some institutions they they have um ways of getting persons to manage they don't give you a, a email box that could hold gigabytes of information because i mean things are being there <laughs> from from your joint until you ready to leave so they they impose storage restrictions so if you don't keep um a good management of your emails then what happens you can't receive anymore right once you reach your storage capacity that's what should happen is that what happens with your emails or you have unlimited space because space is a priority with systems so no, we have limited space. I was just talking to uh, one of my coworkers, and she was saying how her inbox was telling her she needed to delete some items because she's almost at storage capacity. Mm -hmm. But she said she has, because I was talking, I was able to share with her a few points about this class. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking her all those records that she's keeping, because she's keeping a record of client information. But I said, if you're ready, sent them on to be scanned you don't have to keep them anymore no um and she was saying well just in case the client calls a, a, a closed account if the client calls it's easy reference for her where she probably right. wouldn't have to go sit through our system but she'd have her own system see that's like, just it. <laughs> you have to have that one trusted one there but i mean if she's dealing with client it's like a um it becomes a non-record once it goes into the relevance of the system, you right. know? So basically then you clear your box because then your box has to be able to receive additional emails now, right. but it could also, um, in terms of, you could have people, if she wants to if she have like a client file, you realize you could save the email by going to the file, save as, and put that particular thing in a folder and then at yeah. the end of time then she could delete the folder right see, i was because that right. that's what i do i i just create a folder of important stuff and i don't really keep stuff in my inbox like that mm -hmm. because right. then the archive how our system is set up emails be on a certain point of archive mm -hmm. and particularly where i work i can't access my archive emails because that is i don't know somehow the system sees that as accessing the internet so i have no in our area i have no way to email outside of the, the bank mm -hmm. unless it's specifically approved mm -hmm. and so that has to go through a workflow and i'd have to say okay i need um I need this one to be able to go through that has to go through my manager and it has to go through the CEO. Mm -hmm. And then uh, so and then we can't access the internet at all. Okay. And so you know what that is? That's like an information security. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, that's the when it and then um with that because with um and that's why i say with records management you you're talking to numerous um numerous players okay because with that now i don't know if your information classified your data so that you would have some data that's sensitive and would have would require certain things so maybe like stuff related to client or business matters may have that sensitivity grading so you they do and if right. specifically if there's an account name number or the name of a, a beneficial owner in the email mm -hmm. it flags it so mm -hmm. if i send it i send it even within the bank mm -hmm. it'll say it'll there's an alert that pops up that says last sent an email containing this this and this Please check to see why she sent it. So mm -hmm. 
operations will come back and say, you sent an email this morning at 10 o'clock, this, this, and this happened. What was the purpose of you sending this email? So there are a lot of controls in place right to protect the client information right and you know and so so when they look at it they're looking at privacy okay right. as well as security and so security could uh, um entail the fact that like you say client information could have um bank account numbers credit card numbers all of that type of stuff that um definitely they you know the company is liable for you know right. Yeah. So, so they have to take protocols around that, but then it could also be um, a category for um, non-sensitive information, so that mm -hmm. you have that freedom to, you know, interact or work with that. So, so yeah, those protocols come from your from the data classification, and and so record management has to be involved in that from the beginning. Because then as you create, there, there needs to be um, those hooks based on the codes um, for that particular document. If you have document codes that tell you what, what yeah. you do, maybe 501 is a, um, a employee application or 510, it could be an employee training form, whatever that code is, that there should be those personal and um, uh, or what we say sensitive versus non-sensitive tags could be attached. Okay. So yeah, that um, that's essential to to the to making sure the information is managed in accordance to the different protocols. Yeah. Okay. So anyone else has um, a fancy system like Blair? <laughs> I have Blair too fancy. <laughs> who, 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 who's that? Mine, I mean Blair. Oh, 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 oh you say it ain't too fancy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, that's that's a component with electronic management saying that you your emails are now included in the picture, you know? So basically, um, when you're looking at categorization, um, that's categorized by the content, you know? So whatever the format is, you're, you're basically wanting to ensure that the record is not um, altered, whatever format is in. So if, if, it's, if it's on the phone, if it's on your laptop, wherever that information is stored, you, you want the, the key thing is for uh, for records, they should not be altered. Okay. And so like we was explaining, you wouldn't really have email as a category. Okay, but you classify it by the content and the context. Okay. So you could have like a category for contracts. And and your contracts would be indexed by your client and date. And sometimes people don't pay attention to these minute things, but in an electronic system, it means a lot because the date, for example, there's formats, there's so many different formats with people setting up dates and they can impact the result of a search, you know? So ideally there's a, a um, I don't know if it's an ISO, I'll have to double check, but there's a standard, a date standard where it starts with the year. So if it's 2021, you would have 2021 and then you would have the month and then the date. So all of that um, ties into ensuring you're using a standard date format. And the fact that nowadays with electronic information and migration, things need to be standardized to, to help the process. So like one incident, I, I recall person scanning in information, but you have some people computer set on US date style. Anyone know what's the difference with the US and the like European or they have English Australian date styles? Yeah. Um... The European style is day, month, year, and the American standard is month, day, year. Okay. And so you're scanning in images and somebody's using that. 
So what happens when you come into months like January, February, March, April, in terms of, of making a determination, if you are using a US standard, that means you, you would be a little mixed up because um, a first or the third could be a January or it could be what, March. So, you know, all of these are the considerations and control type um, things that you, you have to take, you have to um, be aware of when uh, you are using an electronic system. So even with certain systems, they may require, uh, they, or they have set as a default, the US state system, but you're using your scan um, module or what have you, once, once it entered the um, European style way, you know? So these are things that adjustments would have to be made um, so that you, to accommodate and not impact the integrity of your information, you know? So, so you, may, you may find, oh, you scanning using US state style, and then you notice all your stuff going in quality control, quality control, because the, um, the capture system requires what? The other date style. So you've already scanned and that means you have to go back and clear them from quality control so that they can be processed and stored in the repository correctly. So, you know, it's a lot of little things, but once um, you're in tune to these type of things, when you go to implement or you're a part of a um, team for implementing systems, et cetera, you know, these are the little key things that you have to ask questions about or make sure they line up when you do do your implementation. Okay, so the important thing is you categorize by content, uh, not so much your format. Okay, and basically to implement um, electronic records management, but it encompasses some of the same things we would have been discussing from the fact that you're dealing with paper, you need a corporate or internal sponsor. You need to have your business case or your business need established, okay? And you need to know what, um, what are you looking to, to pinpoint success, uh, basically your metrics. Okay. You want to have some type of a project plan in place as you make that transition to electronic and also how it's gonna be communicated. And then you have to train, you have to train your persons. So that whole thing about an inventory still has to be done in the electronic environment. You can have it phased in, but it has to be done for the entire organization. So you can do your general inventory forms you can conduct interviews with persons who are using the system and, and basically have an identity, um, have some sort of understanding of what systems are in use, who is using them, who are the system owners. Okay, same way you would with um, paper collections to understand who actually is responsible for them. Okay, and um, a term that's coming up now with regard to electronic information is um, what we call ESIs. And that's um, basically, it's a type of a data map. Um, so it's your system information, okay? And that helps to, um, basically this data map helps to smooth, um, I guess, the link between records management and IT, okay? And then it, um, it, it um, kind of brings about that um, need to update the documentation so that basically as Brookwood alluded to in Blair, sorry, in terms of with legal issues, if you are subpoenaed or you have to basically show or defend what actions you've done, 
you you have a map of your data you have your data map and and that pretty much outlines your collection systems who are and flows and basically your risk of, of when you when we talk about sanctions you know based on on actions companies would have done that that risk is reduced because you have this type of um, a data map, okay? But the data map isn't a easy thing to do, okay? You have some informal processes that may be in place with IT to do with procedures. You have systems that are pretty much decentralized. So it's a system used in this one area, um, something else used in another area. And then you also have legacy systems that pose a challenge, okay? Because these systems have been around for so long, they're no longer supported, but they're still being used. People are still using. And so the legacy systems um, is also a challenge because then you have to go back to understanding where they came from and why we still have them. And so when you talk about migrations, et cetera, you know, legacy systems can be that, um, that real big challenge or headache because then you have to basically understand or find, um, be able to uh, put out there the information they contain and how, how you're gonna get that transferred into your new system. Okay, so basically with the move to electronic records, we know that all over the organization they exist and that's, they can be your, like I said, structured and unstructured. And while the structured records, everyone understand the difference between structured and unstructured records. So I guess that's a yes. You, you could touch on it a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. basically because with a structured, um, structured records are those you would find in your databases. You know, they have, they have um, the fields and rows and columns that add up to that record, that particular one record. Whereas unstructured would be your Word documents, your PowerPoints and um, those other type of user, um, user applications that each person creates and they, they either file it in there, you know, there's no, they can, they're all over your, um, your electronic environment with different owners creating them. So there's no, they're not structured like information in a system on a specific system or a database that, um, that clears it up or still need me to explain it some more? That clears it up, makes sense. Okay. Yeah, so, so that's the difficult part to manage your unstructured data, you know, because they're, they're like I say, duplications, they're things that are only in that user space, et cetera. So uh, when you have to, migrate or you're implementing new systems. They, these are all some of the things that basically, um, you know, would pose a challenge in making sure you capture the information you need to capture in your migration process. Okay, so basically the, um, you have your ease e records, okay? Um, these, you can do inventory by the business process or what's the function. And, and most of the um, file plans and inventories that are more, more popular are those that are based on particular functions. Because the thing is to get um, more of what they call a big bucket approach um, and not necessarily too granular, especially if you have a very large organization. 
And then you get into um, thousands of record series, different types of record series. Whereas if you do it, do it at a high level at a particular function, you know, it's something that's easier to control. Okay, so in terms of electronic, you still got to do your inventory. You still have to um, update your retention plans. Uh, basically, with the electronic environment, there's, there's way more duplications, like I said, because information, it, you have information in databases, you have information in private collections, etc. So persons like in the example that was given earlier, you have people keeping their own reference copies. But uh, there, there's a tool now as well that um, you can deploy if you're planning to do a cleanup that helps you to do file analysis tool. That's what it's called. So there, there are lots of them out there and they basically um, would be able to go through and identify areas of duplications. They could identify the last time documents were accessed and all of that um, with a view to helping you organize and classify the information you have um, in your electronic realm, in, in your electronic environment. Okay, so on the systems, the uh, what we call them ERMs, that's the electronic records management system, you Basically, I use, um, you're, you're, you're having to link your series identifiers to folders and classification. So what you're looking at is a, a file structure, an electronic file structure. So can, does, is anyone um, pretty familiar with that? So basically that it's um it's the same process that you you would have had something to outline how you file your your physical records right so electronically you would have to create and so that's where this whole process of having to train comes in because if it isn't um, if you're not trained and this isn't being communicated, persons would still go back to their old way of doing things. So the whole rollout with the records management program requires one at the end of the day, once it's defined, you basically have to now go and train your users on what they can and cannot do. And you know, basically the ins and out of how to do particular things. So training areas to target for training would be what? Persons new to the organization, as well as when there's a shift or a change in procedures or, um, or some policy directives, how does this impact your, um, your management of your information? You then have to find um, the time to do that um, reach out reach out and do that training for for the staff that would have been impacted or you basically will be <laughs> putting all that hard work um, of organizing at risk to you know unraveling and that's why support is so important and awareness is on training there <clears throat> there are some big areas in being able to keep up um, the success and the viability of the program going forward. So I, I know earlier I sent out a sample uh, policy that was from a particular central bank that was in, um, I think it was Trinidad and Tobago. Did anyone get to look at that and see um, some of the areas it addressed. If, do you all have a policy? Mm -hmm. 
You mean the um, the policy the actual, um, an actual? I, I send that out as a sample, just to give you an idea of what uh, a policy related to records management would look like. But I'm just trying to find out if any of you actually have policies in place. Um, Brooke would have been to the company longer than I, longer than me, right? So mm -hmm. I don't, we don't have a policy, right, Brooke, or do we? I, I don't think we have like an overall policy. I think we have policies um, like specific to certain areas. Um, I mean, like, you mean like if in terms of your, like, uh, depart other departments, do you have like an accounts or finance area? Yes, we have a finance department. Oh, okay. So, and then, you know, within, um, if you have an IT department, they usually have a lot of policies with, around um, systems and stuff like that. But if you're planning to or you have that backing and support and you want to build a program, then, um, you know, in terms of what, what type of policy statement you should, you should um, put in place, that is specific to like a regulatory environment. But you can also look at, um, you can also look at other policies, maybe for other areas. I, I just like to throw that out there because you can, even if that policy isn't ideal for your setting, you know, you can, you can still check, you can Google because there are institutions that um, a lot of the US colleges, et cetera, have uh, policies that they willingly share. And it's a lot of, once you um, Google records management policies and um, you can, I, I like to hit the image thing so I could look at what I may be interested in, in um, pulling up. There, there are lots of them out there that for someone like yourself who doesn't have something in place can start to craft one because that is very important in order to get the buy-in that you would need now to go to different units and um, conduct an inventory and eventually end up with a file plan and a retention schedule. Like I say, they're, they're the important tools that you need, you know, to build your program. For sure. So yeah. the, the policy would be, um, specific to say record series or is there like a overall general policy for the entire corporation? Okay, so like records management? the policy is the company statement which outlines that the records belong to the company, the records are an asset and what are your responsibilities as employees with regard to the records as a manager. Remember I, I gave in that first handout some um, pointers with regard to different responsibilities at the different levels. So in your policy, and the thing with policies, it's a general, it's a broad statement and you're gonna have other documents that flow out of that policy. So you don't wanna make the policy because the policy you have to, that has to be sent to the staff. So you want to, you want to have a policy that's pretty, um, pretty compact and not too, not too complex, mm -hmm. you know, because then persons tend to not, um, not pay attention to it. So you want it to be short and um, concise. And then from that policy, then you can then do your procedures or that type of thing. So then you will have your uh, your how tos would come out of what are the core things in that policy. Now, when you talk about record series, record series basically that relates to your file plan. That relates to your um, how how you have those records structured. So so you would have like I say when you talk about a file plan and you're talking about functions in your finance department you would have invoices. 
So that invoice would be a series. And what, what's common with series is that most of the records in that particular series, their, their retention time frame um, is, is um, similar along, you know, is usually the same. So I think I alluded to earlier the fact that when we were looking at disposition and you had to, um, when you're doing physical disposition and you're putting records in a box, you never mix different record series that have different retention time frames. Point being, if you have a box that has record series for three years, five years, 10 years, and they're all in the same box, you're obligated to keep that box now for 10 years. Whereas if you had put all the record series that flow with three years, then you would be getting rid of those routinely. You know, so the record series itself relates to that particular um, type of record. So under your functions for finance, one of your record series would be invoices. Anyone could give me something else that would go as a record series under financial records besides invoices? Um, POs. Purchase, purchase orders, okay. So that's like another series. Okay, so the, the series basically it's dealing with um, it's a like a lower, it's a lower level. Under the function, you're not filing anything. That function is just the headliner to say finance records. So when you even think about setting up um, a filing structure electronically on whatever um, drive, whatever space is allocated for your particular unit to store the electronic records, you then would have your folders. So, so you would have your folders based on the functions. And so persons that are, are linked to that um, particular function or department then would have or access or authorization that whatever they do, their um, company record is filed in that particular folder. So, so if you you do it, you're working with invoice an invoice, and after you've done all the transactions, approvals, etc., that final document would then be filed not on your personal drive, but on the space or the file designated for that that record. So that's why, in terms of talking about the procedures and the processes, it's important that. So persons know where they are to file their work when you're in an electronic environment because um, that impacts um, the integrity, that impacts findability, you know, because if you're all supposed to be placing those records in file on this network drive folder here and somebody is, is filing on their own um, drive or space. Uh, when it's time to do, like we say, an audit, or if there are any queries, or God forbid you have to now go to court on a matter, you know, that that opens up a whole different, <laughs> a whole different can of worms because you're saying this is where you keep it. And then at the end of the day, Susie come with records because you've decided that we need to put a hole on everything. And then you're thinking these would have been gone, but Susie still have them file on her drive. And when litigation happens, if it's there, you have to produce it. So, you know, just, just in a nutshell to kind of illustrate the importance of um, making sure there is a procedure, there's process, and it's known where you put company records, where to file them, you know? And, and remember now, um, when you're dealing with process transactions, that could be multiple and it could be changing, but at the end of the day, the ultimate record should have a final destination that is consistently followed and 
persons know that's where to go to get the official copy of the record. Because electronically, it isn't like back in the day when you, you know, that you did all your drafting and then after that you turn that over to the secretary who produced the official copy and that went into a file. We're in an environment now where literally all employees are a part of that um, record creating process. So knowing who's the owner and where it's actually filed is key to being able to service or facilitate um, your, your search for information. Okay, so uh, we, we definitely have to be uh, at a certain level of understanding with uh, some, some, I guess, some aspects of technology, not the whole thing, but you know, to understand those particular process that will impact us as records managers. So our sphere um, in terms of the control and maintenance also would overlap at times in, in trying to understand um, a few processes that are outside of our realm. So like when we talk about backup, we know that that's primarily like an IT function, but that has implications for us from the whole aspect of retention. Okay, so you, you pretty much wanna understand how your information it's being backed up within the organization. And the backup tapes, how long are they kept? Because if you're, you're doing disposition and you're disposing, but it's being backed up and the backup is being kept long beyond the retention time, that has implications for you as well. Okay, and then, you know, with moving to the electronic realm, you have, um, <laughs> you now have to be concerned, like we were talking about with privacy, data breaches, and all that other stuff. Okay, so it's important that you don't do records management in a vacuum. You have to be involved with the relevant stakeholders and players in your organization that are also a part of making sure the information is managed securely. Okay, so, so the other thing would be with regard to if we are planning to implement a system, we need to be a part of that conversation and it's not just a records management system, but systems in general in the organization there should be a seat at the table for persons involved with managing the information. So I, I, I know I'm talking, <laughs> uh, doing most of the talking, but uh, so far, any questions with regard to the whole records management? Anyone still, still have a lot of concerns with regard to managing information electronically? Um, not, not really. I, I but the uh, discussion helped me to realize though so that um, what we've been referring to in our office as policy is actually procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we really need to work on putting um, proper policy in place and uh, to structure it um, properly. Right. Well, like I said, it seems that you guys. Um, you have that initial support, you know, and that, that's what's important because if you have a manager who ain't, who ain't checking and who don't give five cents, you're not gonna get very far. I might as well, you know, I might as well just say that up front because people are gonna be doing what they want to do. And what you're trying to do is basically avoid 
these pitfalls like um, problems that can you can incur legally, um, loss of information if you have a disaster and your company needs to um, needs to come come on stream again. Uh, you know, it's all it's all going to be impacting how quickly you can do that. And the only way you can do that quickly is if you have in place the necessary um, tools, procedures, and processes to bring people back online with information and not, you know, IT, IT has what I call the bells and whistles. And pretty much the, um, a lot of times in the past, I think over the years, the relationship with IT and records management has been improved. I think there's more respect now for persons within that area. Because prior to that, I think, you know, IT just wanted to say, well, that's, this is the solution. Use this, this can do this, that, and that. But, um, you know, not bearing in mind that there are things that we require consistently to ensure the records are reliable and can be um, depended upon for, for their necessary purpose. So I, I, um, I, I guess right now, I guess it seems like so much information <laughs> coming at you, but like I say, just, just make sure you have it accessible so that when you come to that particular point of the journey, you know, you have somewhere that you, not to, not to have it all spouting out, but you know where to go to find the information to do what you have to do, you know. But um, it, it's, like I say, it has its rewards because at the end of the day, when you see that, and it's a background, it's pretty much a background function, but if it's not done pro pro uh, properly, then you see where it can end up, up front and personal in the space with a lot of serious consequences. So, you know, I just, I just like to tell people is, you know, hey, don't feel, um, overwhelmed or discouraged, but like they say, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So you pick your battles. And if right now you see you don't have a, uh, a program and you need, um, it's needed, it's, it's a absolute necessity to change things, then um, get that support so that you could at least begin an inventory because based on the information from your inventory, that is what will help you um, to craft the various aspects of your program. Because you can't, you can't um, manage some, if you don't know what you're uh, managing, how can you be effective? And that is why when we talk of an inventory, it's, it's like the the um, the beginning, the foundation. You have to do that fact finding to know what is in the organization to be able to then manage it effect um, properly. You know. So basically, in terms of what what um what are the components of of the program. I'll just I'll just see if I can share this with you something that I have here. Okay, can you you guys can see that or it's too small? I can see. Okay. I can see. Yeah. So basically when we even like in talking about what what all we would need to get a program started. Policy and procedure, that's what we were talking about, okay? 
the inventory, your appraisal, because when you do the inventory and you find all these records, um, you need to appraise them because you may find a number of them are no longer in use. You may find that some are worth more than others. So you have to establish that value concept. Okay, and then that time frame of how long you need to keep them before you make a decision on whether to destroy them or send them to an archives. Okay, so we remember when we met, we talked about the record center and the fact that it's considered um, cost effective because you're moving records you no longer need out of your active environment. So that means that you then have space for more important things, the management of those active files. And we talk, well, right now we're talking about um, pretty much electronic environment. But when we uh, looked at stuff like uh, how the, rec the uh, records are maintained or produced, these, that would have been some of the means there, digitization, which is what is the focus right now, really. Like I said, micrographics, pretty much, it's still a viable option. And the thing is, your solution doesn't necessarily have to mean you have to go and buy the biggest expensive system out there. That's why it's so important to know your environment and what your needs are, because something um, may work for you that may not mean expending so much funds on a digitization effort at this time because of the size of your organization. The vital records, you, you need to have that as a part of your program because like I say, they are the records that will make you or break you. They are those records. If a Hurricane Dorian come back again, if we have to relive another pandemic, you have these things, you know where they are, you can, um, you can retrieve them as needed under the circumstances and your operation continues, you know? So something happens, you need these records, you can access these records, you can continue to function within your stated time frame. because basically when you look at vital records, uh, you, and you look at it in with the intention with business continuity. They try to ascertain the time frame that you need to be up and running. And they try to determine what at what point would you be in crisis mode if you still couldn't get to these records. And based on looking at your functionalities, et cetera, some records would be um, priority over others, okay? So if a disaster happens, bam, your priority is your staff safety. So you need to, there's certain rec, your staff information would be a part of that vital component that you would, need be, you would need to have contacts to know how to get to and check to see if persons are okay and that type of thing. Okay, and then in order to, um, to ensure that the program is perpetuated and continues, you know, you have to train and um, make sure persons are involved. Any questions? So I'll put this in your, in the um, notes as well when we talk about um, what all are the components. Okay. So, okay. Also, um, this is a, a little poster that I liked, which pretty much kind of <laughs> has the, the whole spectrum of, of the program. So, and it, it's, it's um, circular in nature, you know, so, so your program 
consists of your your any information it has like features in there about auditing about um disposing protecting okay there's a little b up there which says contaminated information so you have to have a process to make sure that's removed um and it's it's basically evolving so there's something about customer information so these are just like some little snippets of that whole sphere of records management as a program so it's just a little play on the words be a records manager I think I'm looking to see, I should have some more information here. Okay, somebody mentioned about the series. Record series. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So with the record series, I, I guess this is a, um, a broke the, another, um, visual and and that's the point i was explaining so if you see you have um, employment ac applications okay and so basically you have your form you have resumes you have cover letter you have transcript and references okay so that, that all comes under the employment application series. Okay, so that one, so one application having these different things and the time frame, you see where it says kept the same length of time. So on your functional file plan, when you come to your HR rec, um, series of records or what have you under the function to do with employment applications then you would have these particular things you would only have like a series number and then that's where this is determined to say you have a series for employment you are you also have like pension um there's also um what do we call it when you have in organizations, there's um, complaints and disputes. The, uh, if you have like disgruntled employees or um, you can also have, you have training. So that's like another series. So I'm just pointing that out to uh, make sure everyone's clear on when they talk about a record series, what they're referring to. So that's okay. I'm, I thought I had something here with the electronic, um, an image that I wanted to share. Okay, let's this one too. With the life cycle. So ideally, I think this, you know, some of the terminologies differ, but I think this is a, a good snapshot of, of when you think of the life cycle, um, what's happening. Because um, you're not only looking at, when you say a life cycle, you could, you could, could be the creation internally, or it could be the receipt of information from outside. Okay, and then once that information comes in, it's put in use, and then it has to be filed, okay? And um, basically to file it, you're, you're basically, like I say, it has to be transferred somewhere, stored somewhere, and eventually disposed of. And you see the disposition, it's not just destroy, okay? You can also have to archive. You know, so that um, in a nutshell is what our life cycle uh, looks like. Okay. I just wanted to also 
highlight some of the key points with regard to why we have to take this approach for records management. Um, Y'all can see this clearly. It looks, still looks small to me. <laughs> okay. So you can, you, can, you can make out the, you can see it, you can make out the words. Um, I guess I could try and blow it up some more. That's better. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 So these are um, in terms of more benefits when we want to talk, when we want to, because as um, when you're gaining support for records management within your organization, a lot of times these are things that you have to share and you have to focus because like I say, off the bat, sometimes they're not even aware because it's so um, it's so low key. They may not even be aware of how significant this is for the organization. So these are pointers. There enables more informed decision making, like we said, deliver services in a consistent and equitable manner, facilitates effective performance of activities throughout the organization. Okay, and we talk about um, rights, statutory requirements, um, control over access and use. Okay. Okay, so even in terms of retrieval of information and in terms of uh, your archives. So that's why when we talk about disposition, if you have information of what they call long-term or enduring value, you definitely have to ensure it's preserved. And so moving into the electronic realm, what would then happen? You no longer have the paper and we have what we call digitally born um, information because you're creating it from Word, PowerPoint, et cetera. So there's no paper to even begin with. They're now being um, created electronically. And so they still have that long-term value. And so what you have to do, you have to make sure for those documents that are identified as archival, which would basically come at the end of that, um, some documents from, from the break, you can, when you have like um, what they call special occasions that um, relate to achievements and milestones of the company, you would definitely want to keep that. So from the break, you know, that's archival. So, so there are things that can be done to make sure you identify those records from the start, as well as at the time of disposition you would then have um, that discussion and then you can determine that it's for archives. And so those particular records would then have to be um, digitally preserved and their special, their special um, requirements. So anything of an archival nature, because the, there's the um, instability of the, um, the electronic media, the disk drives, et cetera. You know, whereas with paper, you know, some paper lasts for hundreds of years, et cetera. There's that still that instability with the um, electronic media. So you have to put in place proper um, techniques and um, have a particular program software system that ensures they keep those records so that whenever you change systems, upgrade or whatever, those records still become available. Okay, so pretty much you have lots of points that you could write an essay with, with regard to the need for um, taking this important step in um, developing your records management program. Okay, so 
also I, I had this bank I had to um, <laughs> to put up in terms of, you know, people say, oh, um, records management don't bring in any money. But <clears throat> there's a difference because it's what we call <clears throat> those soft <clears throat> dollar savings. The what is gained in being more efficient <clears throat> in being able to access records quickly, you know, in avoiding the risk of having um, non-essentials around, you know, so so that that's um, that's an important part of selling the program as well. Once you're routinely doing disposition, you're saving because you're not having to pay um, extensively long um, time frame of storage fees, et cetera. this one. Okay, so when we look at um, activities involved, we're creating records, we have to inventory them, we create our file plans, how we, we're going to file them. Um, we have retention schedules, uh, our record storage, and disposition, records retention, and disposition, and eventually we make that determination on preservation. Okay, so I'll I will definitely include these in the notes for for our our next session. Okay, also in terms of, I had a, a cute, um, okay, this is since we're in the electronic era and a lot of us like emojis, et cetera. Let me just go back to that. That was um, in terms of the terminologies that you may find on, on different retention schedules. So the, this, some persons, you, they could have a time frame or they could use, like we have here, a retention code. So basically um, it has administrative value. So that, that means that as long as there's administrative need of it, that's how long you would keep it. There's um, the emoji for the fiscal year end Okay, and um, until superseded, that would usually apply to things like policies and procedures. When you come up with a new one, that that new one is the um, effective uh, document. Okay, and this would be permanent, like um, those records of archival value. And then um, you also have you have um, triggers, okay? So something that would apply in relation to a trigger event would be like when an employee leaves for retirement, how long are you required to still maintain that file? So that, that would be linked to things like um, benefits if they are, um, they're entitled to certain benefits, et cetera. And then um, there would also be that element of if there's any legal requirements. And so basically what this is saying is that once that employee leave, that is when that retention time kicks in. Because on some schedules, you will see where it says uh, like a pension benefit record some persons may say after the employee leaves, we keep that for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Okay, and basically whatever your calendar year end is, you have some records you may not need to keep beyond that. And then um, this would basically be for things like, I guess if you have, um, 
when you're thinking about like cars or automobiles or stuff like that, where there's a particular lifespan for that and you would want to keep that, say insurance policies, okay? Um, you would, would basically want to, as long as you have that asset, you would want to make sure that um, that insurance information is there, it's available. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. Let me just go back to the one I wanted, the digital. Okay, this is so big. I, oh gosh. Okay, so in summary, when we talk about uh, managing the this digital components, okay, this um, basically, you know, some of, some of it relates still to you can't even though, like I say, it's a, it's um, electronic. You know, you still have your core reasons that would be um, the same as your physical. So reducing lost document. The big thing um, with digital is faster search and retrieval. Okay, um, in terms of organizing your existing documents, you uh, it's easier um, to move around digital documents into the right folders. But now you have to remember when that it's so easy to create that these documents uh, tend to multiply. So basically um, you still want to make sure you do that routinely and not in an ad hoc way. So once you outline your particular plan, you wanna make sure it's consistent and it's being followed. You know, Although it's granted, you can basically select a whole group of files and move them around easier than you would be um, able to do with physical, okay? The improving general work processes and organization, organizational efficiency. So these are the selling points for the digital um, documents. Okay, we talked about the reduction in the physical space and that's why it's more cost effective when you um, have inactive records to move them to a less costlier space, which would be somewhere like an offsite. Okay. Oh, sorry. So, we see, we just talked about um, the record series and these were just some of the points to say that Basically, you need to have an owner attached, especially with electronic records, because of the, the increased um, opportunity for duplications. Identification of the owner is very, very critical. Okay, chain of custody is important and you need to be able to have audit trails so that when persons access electronic records there's a there's something to say so and so looked at this record on this date at this time okay um being able to deal with um e-discovery meaning when you have legal action uh basically it should be easier with electronic records if they're managed properly but when you have out of control um, electronic setup, meaning that, you know, you, you, you don't have the, those frameworks we talked about in place to say um, what governs what, then you get into problems because the copies can put you in a whole lot of trouble. The copies that are unwarranted, I would say. <laughs> okay. Okay, so based on that, 
Are there any other questions with regard to those pointers? No, mom. I like, I mean, how, the, I like how the PowerPoint breaks everything down. That's okay. Yeah, but I, what I'll do, like I said, I'll forward these in the notes. The second, remember I did one previously for the first time. So I'll just, it'll just be an update, but I'll put more of these, um, the visuals, the graphics. Yeah. Okay, so so you can get to see that. Okay, so um, this one particularly I wanted to share. Oh, sorry. Okay, let me just, um, this part primarily, um, this was from um, one of the universities and they was, this is for their drive, but I, I thought it was good to share it. Okay. And it's like something when you're, you're doing your awareness and stuff like that, you could like create something like this that would help staff to understand um, talking about managing their drives and et cetera. So it's just a, it's just a flyer, but I, I just wanted to share it. So basically they're, they're charging for a particular drive even, you know, but I, we're not in that, that sphere like that really. So but in terms of persons being able to manage and control, they, you know, they find ways based on their scenario of how they um, they can do that. So, and, and I just showed you this because then if you were to develop um, some type of a flyer for you to go out, you could, you would have an idea um, and what you would, it wouldn't necessarily contain like they have, they have fees here for different drives. So, and this is basically from a, a university. Okay, so it has the, um, how to contact them, their number. So when you're doing things with awareness, if, if it's um, a poster or whatever, you always make sure you include um, something that uh, allows the, uh, the employees to be able to reach out and contact you. So, the, so uh, if there are any questions or queries. So I like this part here where they're talking about the cleanups and it had points to say um, how to create. Oh boy, I, I have to get my, my charger, I'm going down. I hope I don't cut off, but it's almost time let me see if I could I could make it. If if not, we may be disconnected. Okay, so like I say, that was just a flyer, and this was another one that I liked. What had um it was it had a little bit more categories, and I th I think somebody else somebody also used this. I'm starting to go through the, the um work but actually creation a receipt distribution, active storage stuff. So that, that, um, that was good. Okay. Okay, so this here was just some terminologies that you would you'd run into whereby we do have a difference in how we interpret certain terms. Okay, so basically in terms of archiving, what we um, look for when we talk about archiving may be perceived differently by IT. Okay, so they may only think about it as moving the data, whereas we're talking about keeping the information. So when we talk about archiving, we're talking about ensuring things are in place that keeps the information available despite um, changes in technology, et cetera. Okay, so even in terms of a file and a record, okay, basically for, for IT, it's just a field in a database. For us, it's an official document, okay? So 
when we have the conversations, these are um, good to know so that you would be able to um, address or speak, speak to them based on what you're trying to accomplish. Okay, so we also have office of record and um, some other terms, preservation. Okay, so they, these were some other tool that there's a differing view in terms of, of IT. Yeah. So basically, I just wanted you guys to make sure um, complete other readings for the, the last set of chapters that uh, were, were sent. And then I would, um, I would forward you these notes and basically confirm the exam time and how um, in terms of the process, because um, Roll and uh, that's Brooke, you're in, you're, you're in Freeport proper, right? You're right in Freeport? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. But um, so you've done courses with this before? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'll 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 definitely have to reach out in terms of the format for that exam for you guys. Okay. Okay. So thank you so much, and everyone have a safe weekend. And the the notes would be um I basically would um send them to you once I send the uh, homework back. Okay. 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 All right. Thanks so much. Thank you, mom. All right. Have a good weekend, everybody. Okay. Bye. Miss Moss.